So welcome again. This is um, the last class for um, April. Um, and today we're going to be talking about organic gardening. And our speaker today is Faye Kusman. She is the horticulture agent in Woodford County. Um, if you haven't done so already, please, whenever you come in from the waiting room, um, put your name in the chat box so that can help us to um, take attendance as to who all registered and who all is joining us. Um, since this is the last class of April, shortly we will be um, posting those recordings from the classes in April, so be looking for an email from that. Um, if you signed up for anything and you couldn't make it, um, they have all been recorded and they will be available in the next week or so. So that'll give you an opportunity to, to still listen in. Um, if you have questions throughout the um, session today, just put those in the chat box and we will address those at the end of the session. Um, Adam, Faye, Ray, do you all have anything else before we get started? You covered it all. Okay, very good. So again, uh, we have Faye joining us. She is our speaker today, um, Woodford County Horticulture Agent. And welcome everybody. And Faye, you can take it away. <laughs> awesome, thanks Jessica. Can you see my screen, the right one? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. I wanna double check always. Um, okay, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I am gonna be talking about organic gardening um, or more so um, using organic methods in the home garden. Um, so as Jessica said, feel free to type questions in the chat box and I'll try to watch that as I go um, as well, but then I'll have the other agent hosts on here to um, make sure they watch it at the end for me to answer those. So let's make sure I can advance here. Okay, so some things that I'm going to cover is what organic means. Um, and then we're gonna talk about five steps um, to building a healthy organic vegetable garden, and then uh, just different ways to take action um, in, your, in your home garden. So the definition of organic in the sense that the, the technical definition um, from the, the United States Department of Agriculture natural or National Organic Program is organic is a labeling term that indicates that the food or other agricultural product has been produced through approved methods these methods integrate cultural, biological, and mechanical practices that foster cycling of resources, promote ecological balance, and conserve biodiversity. Synthetic fertilizers, sewage sludge, irradiation, and genetic engineering may not be used. So that is for the standard as the organic associate or the organic uh, standard if products are going to be called um, organically certified. So what organic is not, it's not just the avoidance of conventional chemicals. It is more than just substituting organic inputs for or inorganic ones. So we're gonna talk about how organic, growing organically is much more than just choosing uh, an organic spray, um, as I say here, or an organic fertilizer. There is much more that goes into it. So organic gardeners generally subscribe to the following principles. Um, of strong emphasis on building a healthy soil. Um, and so that includes uh, having a really diverse microbial population. And as you know, there's a lot more now um, being studied in that realm of, of, micro, of microorganisms. And even within our own bodies, um, you know, you can buy all kinds of probiotics now, and there's a bigger push for that and studying the microbiome in our own body and how that helps us fight off disease. Well, the same goes for the soil and having a really healthy microbial population in your soil is similar to having a healthy uh, microbial population in your body. Um, and then of course, building organic matter in your soil so that you do have a healthy soil, which then fends off disease, um, making sure your soil has a proper pH, good fertility. Um, and so all of that is a holistic approach, which then helps with pest and disease management. And then the, the final one there is use of only natural derived, uh, derived fertilizers and pest control products and using them sparingly. Um, so I'll go through it and talk more about that. So uh, home, home, home gardeners um, are gonna use a balanced approach. Um, and so that means being willing to accept some damage if you're gonna be doing um, organically because there is gonna be uh, damage at some point that you cannot you know, get everything, get all insects. 
and then be, be willing to spend more time on conditioning the, school, the soil and scouting for those problems in the garden to catch them early on before they become a problem, before you have to go in and spray. So this is going back to the United States Department of Agriculture Natural Organic National, gosh, I keep saying natural, National Organic Program. And as you see there, the label that we know of, if you go into the store and buy an organic product is USDA, USDA Organic. Um, and I already uh, you know, mentioned the definition of that. But then you also see a lot of these labels now where it's 100% natural, uh, different things like that, but there's no definition of natural. Um, it's kind of undefined and not regulated. So just be aware that there's a big difference between something being called 100% natural and being called actually organic. And so these are the, 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 um, the labels that are what we consider yeah, USDA organic or OMRI listed, which means organic, I forget the, um, basically OMRI listed is organically uh, certified or acceptable um, uh, inputs. And so our, um, uh, who regulates all the organic uh, growers here in, in Kentucky is the Kentucky Department of Agriculture. And so everything goes through them, applications for certification and all the regulations and guidance. And we have a great program here in Kentucky um, and great help um, for our, from, uh, from our farm service agency that provides um, money towards getting certified because it can be costly um, just to a lot of help um, in that realm. And we also have the Organic um, Association of Kentucky Oak Group that does a ton of really great work. Um, they do field days and other things to support organic farmers in Kentucky. So the o Oak Group is a, is a great resource for organic production here in Kentucky. But now we're going to bring it down to the home garden and what that means for us as home gardeners, because obviously we're not going to have to go through all of these regulations or anything. But as a home gardener, um, you know, if you're growing your own products, you don't want to have to be spraying all the time and you don't want to have to um, worry about that, that kind of stuff. And that's why, you know, you're interested today in doing this is because you want to learn how you can do it in your home garden in, in, in an organic way. And so the first step um, as I mentioned, I'm going to go through the five steps of having uh, a, an organic garden. And the first step is building your soil. And that's the most um, foundational important step in having your organic garden. Um, and organic matter is key to that. This improves your soil structure and your drainage. And then it increases those good microbes and earthworms, the good microorganisms that I mentioned before, that in building a good population of those, you're really helping build that soil and um, which then helps have healthier plants. Um, and then the organic matter also holds and then releases nutrients slowly to the plants. And so in thinking about what, what is um, organic matter and what are, what are things that you can add to help build your organic matter, well, there's several options. You can do cover crops. And so normally fall is a great time to do cover crops. We um, partner with the, our local Woodford County Conservation District to offer a home gardener cover crop giveaway usually in the fall. But a fall is a really good time to put down cover crops. Normally you plant them September or October and do like a winter wheat or a rye. And it, it protects the soil, it keeps the weeds down, but also builds um, your organic matter in your soil. Um, and then of course it helps prevent erosion or anything else when you leave the soil bare. And so another way, you know, there are lots of options for um, cover crops that grow through the winter, as I mentioned, but then there's also things like buckwheat that can grow in the summer um, and other options that are really great to bring in beneficial pollinators as well to help um, fend off the, the bad bugs. And then of course manure is one of the most common ones we know as a source of organic matter and to supply nutrients in a slow release form. Um, but of course when you get manure um, you want to make sure that it's composted or if it's not then you're definitely going to have to put it down in the fall and then um, let it sit for at least 120 days to, to completely break down 90 to 120 days, depending on um, what you're growing to, to entirely break down um, before you grow the crop. Um, but manure is a great source for organic matter and nutrients 
And then compost um, that you can make your own if you're talking about just food scraps. So composting is a great way. You can see on the bottom uh, picture there is a, a three bin compost system and it's a great way to recycle your food scraps and not have to throw them into the landfill. Um, and it can be a good um, amendment to your soil as well. And then mulch can also be um, used, but you do want to be careful um, if it's not composted down. You never want to put fresh mulch and work it into the soil because that can really tie up nutrients. So you want to make sure that they're um, completely broken down if you're going to be using them. So some an example is usually in the fall, um, all of the leaves we will collect and then shred up with the with our lawnmower and then wait and let them compost down really well. Um, before we then apply them onto the soil and the earthworms love it. But we wanna be sure those are broken down so they don't tie up nutrients. Um, so it's something that we always wanna make sure that we um, tell people to, to take a soil sample in any classes you've been to, I'm sure you've heard this over and over from us, but definitely take advantage of your local county extension office um, here in Kentucky. As you know, we have one in every county. And so I know here, soil sampling thanks to our conservation district, but in other counties, um, most counties do, and if they don't, it's as cheap as $6.50 um, $6 a sample, and it will at least give you a baseline um, for what your soil pH is, um, and then what you need um, to apply to your soil as far as fertilizers. Most of the time, our phosphorus and potassium levels are really high here. So it's really important to know that information so you're not just throwing down fertilizers, not knowing what you truly need. And then organic matter, we don't do that on our soil test, but you can pay to, to have that tested as a separate thing. Most home gardeners don't just because they know they're building the soil, but your ideal kind of organic matter is about 4% um, to 5%. Okay, so that's number one, is building the soil. And I talked about all the ways to do that. Um, and then the next number two step is putting the right plant in the right place and time. And so choosing the right plants and the seed, um, if you're purchasing um, plants at, the, at your garden center um, or growing them on your own, just make sure that those are healthy, healthy seedlings. Um, so for example, you don't want uh, to buy a plant, uh, a tomato, for example, at the store that has, you can tell it's been stressed and been in the pot for a long time if it's just a short little plant and it's already blooming. Um, I have some plants back here. We do our plant sale for our uh, master gardeners, do our plant sales every year. You can see here, I've got a light set up back there and the lights are really close to the plants. There's a lot that goes into growing your own seedlings, but this could be an example of a plant that you would see at a garden center that would already have, this is a pepper, that would already have flowers on it. Well, you know that it's been really stressed um, and if it's already flowering, because you want all that growth to be going it, into it getting bigger before it's flowering at this stage. And so there's lots of um, options of seed catalogs out there where you can buy all kinds of different neat um, open pile pollinated or what we call heirloom varieties or hybrid or organic seed. And I do um, wanna point out that there's a lot of seed companies now for home gardeners that um, advertise that they're not genetically modified seed, but most all of your, your garden seed for vegetable gardens is not gonna be genetically modified. It costs them a fortune to make genetically modified seed and the seed itself is gonna cost a fortune. So that's all more of your larger scale uh, feed corn and soybeans and things like that that are going to be genetically modified. But, so that's more of just a uh, selling point for those companies. Um, so normally we don't ever see genetically modified seed for, for home gardeners. Anyways, it's just a marketing kind of scheme. Um, and then plant in the right place. Um, so as you know, of course, there's any, any type of way that you're going to plant, whether it's in containers, in the ground, or in raised beds, but anywhere you, you plant them, you're gonna to wanna to have at least six hours minimum of sun per day, six to eight. You wanna make sure you have access to water. And as you can see, um, nice fence, protection from critters, all that good stuff. Here's uh, my garden, I have raised beds, um, just cause it's, it's easier for us to maintain having two small kids and um, working full, full time. And it just helps us keep up with weeds and make sure that 
um, we can maintain what we have and regularly scout it and keep up with everything so we're not having to have an outbreak of pests that we then can't control and have to spray with something. So I, I practice organic gardening in my, in my garden at home. Uh, another one, this is what I had before raised beds, um, mounded soil, but um, keeping the size to manageable, something manageable as well. Um, even in what we have here as a family of four is much more than we can ever eat. Um, so keep it to at, at the right size, for what makes sense for your family. And then planting at the right time. We have our Vegetable Gardening in Kentucky guidebook um, that most of you probably know about, but if you don't, it's definitely what we refer to for all of our vegetable gardening um, resources. And you can pick up a, a copy um, at any of your local extension offices, or you can find it online, Vegetable Gardening in Kentucky guidebook, if you do a search for that or ID 128. And as you can see here, it has a really great uh, planting calendar that tells you exactly. So for us, we're in central Kentucky. And um, so, you know, here we are in April, we can be putting out our, our broccoli plants and our cabbage and um, all the spring crops, the lettuces, um, and pretty soon at the end of the month, beans and corn. So it tells you when to plant, which really helps uh, later on down the line. And then of course, you know, as I mentioned, we have our cool season crops, which are spring and fall, warm season, which are our summer crops. As I just showed you the planting dates for various crops or that table I just showed you in our um, Vegetable Gardening Kentucky guidebook. Okay, so making sure you're planting at the right time, all that kind of stuff, getting healthy plants. Now our step number three is fertilizing wisely. And so the main, the three main plant nutrients, which are called the macronutrients, are nitrogen, which is the, the leaves, what makes the leaves healthy, phosphorus, which um, it's what helps with roots, flowers, and fruits in your, in your vegetables, and then potassium. So N, P, and K, and potassium is overall health and, and disease resistance for your plants. So you wanna make sure you have those nutrients at the right levels. Um, and so an example of an all-purpose organic fertilizer, which uh, Garden Tone, you can see that a lot, of, find that a lot of stores, um, has a nutrient value of 3% nitrogen, 4% potassium, and 4%, or sorry, 4% phosphorus and 4% potassium. But as I mentioned, with the soil samples, we normally find that phosphorus and potassium are already at really high levels in our soils, at least here in Woodford County. So doing that soil test to make sure that those make sure you actually need those before you apply this all-purpose fertilizer that has all the, those nutrients. Um, and then the nice thing about a lot of organic fertilizers is they'll also have what we call micronutrients, uh, which are all the other nutrients that plants just need in smaller and much smaller levels, um, but it, it can also have some of those in there. But these macronutrients are the main ones that the plants need. And so organic fertilizers, um, like I said, they do put, supply a wide range of nutrients. So it's not sometimes not just the macronutrients, but also those micronutrients. Um, and they provide them slowly. So that's the difference in the synthetic fertilizers that you get an instant, um, an instant hit with them. You put them on and it's instantly absorbed by the soil. Whereas with organic fertilizers, they, the microorganisms actually have to break them down before they become available to the plants. So they normally provide those nutrients slower over time. Um, and so that's why sometimes um, people will do foliar applications of, um, of fertilizers. So like a foliar application of fish emulsion, there's all kinds of options out there now, uh, kelp and all this stuff that people will do foliar if you're needing an instant um, for it to be absorbed uh, more rapidly than if you're applying it in the soil. But just remember, you're never wanting to just think about um, the plant absorbing the nutrients. You're really wanting to think about over the long term feeding the soil. So you're building up that organic matter and building up those microorganism levels to where you'll have a healthy soil. So then you have a healthy plant. So it's not just about feeding the plant. It's about feeding the soil. So keep that in mind. Um, and the central tenant in, in organic agriculture is to feed the soil. Um, so then feed the crop. So as I mentioned, keeping that in mind. 
this is a really great table in our, um, actually this comes out of our master gardener uh, manual, um, which we're doing, uh, Franklin and Woodford County, we're partnering and doing a, a master gardener training this fall. If you are interested, um, contact Adam or I about that. It'll be starting in August, but this comes out of a table out of that manual um, and it's nutrient contact content. I cannot talk today, nutrient content and release rates of organic fertilizers. And it goes through and shows you um, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium levels of all of these different organic fertilizers and how available they are. So you see medium to slow, medium to rapid, um, and it's a really great resource. Um, I will, we will share this PowerPoint with you um, after this presentation, it'll be emailed to everybody um, so that you have this to refer to. And then this is a great table in that Vegetable Gardening in Kentucky guidebook, that ID 128 that I've referred to a few times, that tells you the recommended timing for side dressing vegetables. So then that way you know what is a good time to fertilize um, when your vegetables are growing. So for example, let's look at um, peppers. So they say to fertilize them after their first fruit set. So once you have a little pepper on there, you wanna go ahead and start fertilizing them. Okay, so we talked about fertilizing. Um, feel free to type any questions in the chat box because I am monitoring that if you have them as I go here. If you have questions about anything I've already discussed. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is, um, so we've talked about you know getting up and building your soil. And uh, now how do you manage the problems organically once you do have them? Because inevitably we still have problems even when we have healthy soil. So there's a lot of um, bugs that you have to deal with and I'm sure you've dealt with in having a vegetable gardening, a vegetable garden. Um, and so some of these might be the Colorado potato beetle. If you've grown potatoes, it's that bug right here in this upper left corner. The squash bug, another terrible one um, that you have to deal with on the right hand corner here and the stink bug. So this is where it comes in uh, and to be very important to constantly be scouting your garden, to go in there and be regularly checking, turning those leave, leaves over. As you can see that these little pests hide their eggs, they're really small and they're on the undersides of the leaves. Um, so if you can turn those leaves over and look for those eggs and scout and just smush them with your thumb um, and smush those egg cases, um, that will help to avoid when they actually hatch and then it becomes much bigger of a problem. So learning to notice what those eggs look like. Um, and over time, you know, there's only so many pests normally for a certain crop. So there's only, you know, certain pests that are going to affect, uh, for example, squash. Um, so you learn to, to know those, those couple of bad pests. So a really great way um, organically to uh, exclude those pests is with row covers. And these are just those tobacco floating covers or reme as they're, they're called um, that you can cover um, your beds with. And a really great way to do it is as you see here, you use PVC pipe to put over your um, beds and then you can easily put it over or you can put it directly on the beds, which that's more of what you do in the spring if you're gonna have a late freeze and you've already put things in. So it's better to have these hoops that you can easily uh, take the sides off of or uncover um, when it's really hot, but you wanna make sure they're very breathable um, screens. And then for something like squash, you still have to um, let it, it still has to be pollinated. So when it's blooming, you do have to take these covers off and the best time is early in the, in the day um, when the pollinators are out, you take them off and let them poll get pollinated and then you can cover them back up um, for at least those first um, few days that they're, they're, or at least during the bloom time. Um, and then definitely a key is recognizing and keeping your good bugs. So recognizing um, some of you might know that on the right hand side, that's the larval stage of, 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 a, um, of a, lady, a ladybug. <laughs> um, and then lace wings and assassin bugs. All of these are really good bugs that are going to help um, fend off the bad bugs. And we have, and I know I put pictures in here of this really great guide we have of um, what all of the beneficial insects look like. And it has awesome pictures. And I put a link in here to that publication. Um, so that you can go through there and see the pictures of what all our beneficial insects look like. 
plant companion. So companion planting, if any of you do the webinar Wednesdays that are uh, the statewide webinars that we do um, each Wednesday, uh, Amanda Sears, the horticulture agent in Madison County just did a presentation yesterday on companion planting. Um, and so there's some really uh, neat resources on that that you might read. I have a couple books, Carrots Love Tomatoes and Vegetables Love Flowers. Those are a couple neat ones that talk about companion planting, um, but there's a lot um, that goes into it. There's not a whole lot of research backing um, it really working, but for some reason, you know, you, there's, there is some definitely some um, things that you can find in there that, that work for you um, in trying these different things. Um, but definitely there's no silver bullet for insect control for organic gardening. Even the commercial uh, organic gardeners, there's only so many products that are approved for organic, uh, organic um, production. And so insect, um, it's always a battle. And so beginning with healthy plants and then avoiding excess fertilizers, because if you over fertilize, you're going to have more insect problems, um, avoiding excess irrigation because the wetter it is, that's also when the problems come in, but just doing that regular scouting. And there are um, products out there for home gardeners. Um, and so some of those, this is another um, table from that Master Gardener Guidebook. Uh, BT, BT is a great product if you're just dealing with caterpillars. So if you have um, broccoli and cauliflower in your garden right now, you know about the cabbage looper um, and it, it's the white moth that flies around um, and then they, they lay their eggs and the little tiny green caterpillars will be all over um, the plants. And so BT is a great um, pesticide that's very targeted just for caterpillars. Um, and that's another thing I want to point out is that most, a lot of um, uh, pesticides out there are broad spectrum, broad spectrum, meaning they will kill every insect. And so then you're killing a lot of your good bugs and you're a lot of your pollinators and you don't want to do that. So anytime you can find more targeted uh, specific pesticides that target certain things. Um, and so insecticidal soaps, um, they can kill things like aphids and thrips and white flies. Kaolin, kaolin clay is something that some people will use. It covers the whole plant and makes it look really ugly, but it's just a natural clay product that is more of a um, deterrent. Um, and there's been mix, it's, there's mixed um, on how well it works, um, but it can be good for things like, um, gosh, I'm trying to think right now, the little uh, flea beetles, that's what I'm trying to think of. For flea beetles and things like that, that put little holes in the leaves, um, it can be good for that. And then neem is kind of good for a lot of the di different things, white flies, thrips, um, can't even be for it also for caterpillars. And then pyrethrins, which can, are definitely more toxic because they can kill our pollinators are, as well, but they're, they come from the chrysanthemum flower, but pyrethrins are um, actually an organically approved product. But like I said, they can be um, pretty toxic too. If you look at the label, it does have a lot of cautions on it. So does, that's another point to bring up that just because it's organic does not necessarily mean that it's completely safe. You still, these products can still be um, toxic to, uh, wildlife and water sources and, and other bugs. So always keep that in mind and read the label on anything that you're going to get. Um, so, and then um, spinaceds, that's another one. Um, Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew is one that's a really great product um, that can be used for many different insects, as you see there. It's spinaced is the active ingredient, but that Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew is what it's called, and it can be used for a lot of things. Caterpillars, leaf miners, thrips, moss, Colorado potato beetles. Uh, there's a ton of things labeled on there for it. Um, and then sulfur actually can be used for spider mites um, and things like that. So just knowing what insect you have is very important to know then what you should be applying, not just you know, putting something on there without knowing first what you have. And of course we can help you with the extension office and, and determining, you know, you send a picture, whatever, we can help you uh, determine what you have going on. And then I, this is an example from that vegetable garden in Kentucky guidebook that shows you, uh, the nice thing is that for each crop, it has in the very back, it'll go into each crop um, and so, for example, tomatoes, it'll have a whole thing about information on tomatoes and it'll tell you the most common pests that affect that crop. So there's one for peppers, tomatoes, um, all the different crops in there. So then at least you can kind of narrow it down uh, from that. And this is a little chart telling you, and then it'll have insect treatments, which most are synthetic um, pesticides, but there are some organic options on there too. 
This is that guide I was telling you that has information about natural enemies of vegetable pests. And so those are all your good bugs that you wanna keep and make sure that if you do see that you leave alone and they will be killing off the bad bugs. Here's an example of beautiful pictures inside this guide. Um, and it's showing you all those great bugs and what they're doing. Um, and so um, you can find that online by just Googling the title here, or um, we can send you a link of it. But like I said, you can get a copy of this presentation after and find that. And so another thing in, um, in control of all of this is suppressing weeds. Um, as you know, that can be the hardest thing, and especially in organic production, there are not there are no products that really truly work for weed control as far as herbicides in organic. And so you need to do a lot of things. Um, mulching, so using um, straw, which can also help with keeping down disease in the garden um, because the splashing from the soil can bring up a lot of diseases. So if you can keep some mulch down, especially straw works well, um, maybe newspapers under that and then straw on top. Um, spacing plants to where they shade the weeds, so close enough but not too close because you always want to get airflow through there so plants can dry out and not get too diseased. Um, but pulling or hoeing really are the main um, things with weeds. Planting cover crops um, in big open spaces to cut down on weeds can help because um, as I mentioned there's a lot of options especially for the summer but also in the spring and fall. Um, and then making sure that you bring in um, in the garden only materials that you know are, weed, are free of weed seeds. So sometimes even tools and uh, lawnmowers, things like that can have weed seed on them. So make sure you're, you're thinking about that. And then uh, definitely not allowing existing weeds to go to seed. And then that's where you really get in trouble. If you can keep those seeds cut out before they go to seed, then at least you can cut down populations for the future and not continuously have the problem. Um, and so in various different ways to mulch, you have options of newspapers, cardboard, um, pine straw, which um, you know, can be a little acidifying. So just watching what you're using on that, but things like blueberries, pine straw is great for um, chopped or composted leaves, hardwood mulches, which is better to use in between your rows, especially if it's not um, uh, uh, completely, co completely composted down. That's what I use in between my rows is just hardwood mulch. We call the local tree company and ask them to, whenever they were in the area, they have to get rid of their, uh, what they grind up of the trees anyway. So we asked them to come and dump. And one day we came home and had a giant mountain of um, wood chips in our, in our driveway, uh, which was a little overwhelming, but it was great because we ended up using them in between our rows and we really cut down on weeds um, in the garden. Um, and there's things like wheat, that straw, of course, and then um, plastic, some people use plastic. And then, as I mentioned, cover crops and then landscape fabric is a big thing now that a lot of the organic, uh, larger scale commercial organic producers uh, use to keep down with weeds, just because it's so hard as you get larger in scale to keep, keep up with weeds since you can't, like a traditional uh, conventional agriculture, you know, there's lots of sprays and herbicides you can use, whereas you can't. Uh, landscape fabric comes into play and, and helps a lot with that. And I just want to point out that there's so many cool tools um, for gardens that you can't necessarily find at your uh, big bark box store. Um, I recommend looking at, um, there's uh, Earth Tools um, is in Owenton, Kentucky, and they are, uh, they have all kinds of neat products. And I just, um, say go on their website and just look at all the different tools that are out there that will kind of open up your mind to more options. Um, my favorite is the stirrup hoe. And as you can see right here, and you just pull it back and forth. And these are great tools for when the weeds are small um, that you can just go through there once a week and cut out those small weeds and, um, and not have to worry about them for, for later on. Um, and in managing diseases, um, you wanna choose as much as you can resistant varieties. Uh, so there's a lot of varieties now um, that are more resistant to different diseases. If you've had tomatoes, I'm sure you've had early blight. There are a few early blight uh, now that uh, breed, they've bred some varieties that are resistant to early bl blight, um, but people have said they're just not as flavorful. So some of the heirloom varieties tend to be not, not as disease resistant as some of the hybrid, um, but of course the flavor and the uniqueness of the, uh, the heirlooms is always something that home gardeners enjoy. Um, so just trying to think about managing those diseases. Remove and destroy diseased plants. Um, that's something that I always will just let, uh, uh, you know, I have plenty of tomatoes in the garden, but I will see that the diseases come in and, and trying to control it early on. But once I know that it's 
covered on the plant instead of just pulling it out a lot of times I'm, I think well there's still tomatoes on there I'm going to get a few I might as well eat but honestly you know pull it out of there and, and keep it from spreading to other plants and then try not to compost that because in our home compost systems we never get the temperature up high enough to kill off disease so it's better to just throw those away. And something you can do for early blight is just trimming off those bottom leaves on the plant um, it, before it spreads up to the rest of the plant. And then you can spray something like copper on there as a preventative. But a big thing is rotating crops. Um, so I know a lot of home gardeners don't have the space necessarily to rotate. So that can be a struggle. But as much as you can, um, try to uh, rotate crops. And it's the best way of avoiding disease, disease and pest problems. Um, so just some examples of different, um, but uh, let's see, I meant to go into the groups of related crops here before that last one there, but this just shows you the different plant um, families and rotating between these. So, you know, the sol solanaceous crops, if you had any of those in a bed, um, like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, potatoes, try not to plant them in that same bed again next year. Try to plant, uh, you know, another family, the cucurbits in that bed. Um, and then back to this, um, nutrient cycling, it's another good thing that you can think of for, um, for rotating and, and um, thinking of uh, in categories. This probably should have been back in the fertilizer section, but um, there's some uh, fertilizers are, are, sorry, crops are in different areas. So that heavy feeders, the light feeders and the heavy givers. So the givers are ones that are good and actually help uh, supply nutrients in the soil versus um, the heavy feeders that take a lot of nutrients out of the soil. So just think about that and when you're fertilizing and going in with the next crop that things like broccoli, cabbage, corn, cucumber, squash, and tomato are heavy feeders. So you're going to have to think about that. They're going to pull a lot of nutrients out. So you want to think about fertilizing. And then also when you're going in with the next crop, know that a lot of nutrients are going to be depleted out of that spot. Um, this is another, uh, this is in that vegetable gardening in Kentucky guidebook. And I just wanted you to know that the uh, plant families are in that book so that you know, so that you can refer to that to know how to rotate or which crops to rotate between. Um, so some organically approved uh, fungicides that you can use. Um, Serenade is one that um, can kind of be a um, all purpose kind of, um, fungicide for things like early blight, um, many different things. Neem oil, another broad spectrum one, it's also a, fun, it's a fungicide and an insecticide. Coppers, um, a lot of those, most of those are organically approved, but you know, for the home garden, definitely it's used a lot for, um, for, for control of most diseases um, that, we, that we have in the garden that are funguses. And then um, for powdery mildew, there's a couple options on there too this by potassium bicarbonate. And then sulfur is another one that can be used for uh, mostly powdery mildew. And then uh, the kale and clay, like I mentioned before, that was more of a deterrent for insects. It coats the leaves it's like a physical barrier and surround um, is what that's called as, and it can be used as a fungicide. Okay, and so finally we're going into step five. Um, and that this is where you're going into what I mentioned before, observing your garden and, um, and just watching. So, you know, going in there regularly, managing those weeds, destroying the bad bugs, if you can, squashing them by hand, um, fertilize if needed, not just as a thing you do, but fertilizing when and if you need it, um, trying to succession plant. Um, so thinking about having things over the long term, so you can plant, so for example, plant beets, you know, smaller row. And then instead of having all the beets ready at the same time, so maybe in two weeks from now, you plant another little small row. So that's what we call successive planting and also with uh, lettuce and things like that, that you can keep slowly planting small amounts so that you have them over time. And then keeping a log is really important as well. Um, so try to keep a log of um, what you've done in the garden. And hopefully we're gonna have this calendar pretty soon. Um, you can ask me again in a few weeks, but this is a great growing your own garden calendar that's actually just a dry erasable that some of our county offices will have where you can go in into each week and kind of make your garden notes um, from year to year. 
uh, with watering, watering is another thing that we might not um, think about as, but is very important because you can, you can have a lot of disease if you're overhead watering. Water in the morning if possible so that you, the sun will dry it off um, during the day so that it's not sitting on the plants because then you can get, you can, it, which can cause disease as I mentioned. Uh, so water the soil, not the leaves water deeply less often. So instead of just going through and watering real quick, I see people do this all the time where they're just watering and water it, you know, for five, just a couple minutes. It's better to water for a long time to where it really penetrates deeply into the soil than it is to just water more often just in quick spurts. Drip irrigation or soaker hoses is definitely the best. Um, we've installed some drip irrigation, really simple drip. Um, it's not the soaker hoses, but it's little drip tubes. It's hard plastic that have little little holes in them uh, every few inches. And it's a long-term thing that will stay there forever. And you put it on a timer um, and it works great. And, and easy to install, pretty relatively inexpensive. And this is another uh, table from that Vegetable Gardening Kentucky Guidebook that tells you the critical times to water. So that kind of helps you think about um, when you should water. And then think about at the end of the season, you want to remove all the plant debris, and get it out of there, especially if you've had disease problems. Uh, mulch any bare soil or put cover crops on it. Um, falls also the time where you plant crops like garlic. Uh, and then as I mentioned, planting cover crops to keep that soil. So the five steps, build your soil, plant the right plant at the right place in the time, fertilize wisely, manage your problems um, in the organic ways we talked about and observe and care for your garden. And then I have a whole list of resources here. Um, and as I mentioned, um, these will be available to you uh, by email when we send this um, PowerPoint out. And then don't forget um, our next class is coming up for May. We have summer tree ID, container gardening with ornamentals, top perennials. And then our June classes will focus on the environment, environmentally friendly, environmentally friendly lawn care, rain barrels and composting. And enjoy your garden. If you have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer those now. Thank you, Faye. That was really good information. Um, I think a lot of us can use whether we are officially organic or we just want to, um, you know, be a little bit more mindful about products and chemicals and things that we use. Um, Ray and Adam, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I have not seen any questions in the chat box yet. So if anyone has any questions, feel free um, to put those in. Um, and also in the chat box, I um, put in some links that Faye mentioned. Uh, one of them is the, the companion planting class that she mentioned that Amanda Sears did for the webinar Wednesday. There's a link to that video, um, as well as a link to the webinar Wednesday YouTube channel um, and a link for the IPM scouting guide for the natural enemies. So, okay, we've got a question. We have a section of our garden we just found out that we will not be using. What is a good plan for the unused garden space? Is there a cover crop you recommend? Okay, um, great question. So um, I guess if it's gonna be empty through the summer, um, buckwheat is something that you can plant um, at the, you can already go ahead and plant it at the end of this month, um, April, end of April to be the beginning of May once the danger of, of a freeze or frost is over. Um, and so you can plant that and buckwheat grows really fast and blooms and a ton of pollinators really, really like it. Um, I'm trying to think of some others. Crimson clover is a really good one that, that provides nitrogen into the soil. Um, and it's really beautiful, beautiful red, uh, red flowers. Um, I'm trying to think of some other, we have a really good publication on cover crops for the home garden actually. Um, and you guys, Amanda had made that publication. Um, and Jessica, maybe I can email that to you um, that you can I, then- have. I have Amanda's, I can email that oh. out with the PowerPoint presentation if yes. you too. Okay. Yep. That would be great. Yeah, because I can't think of any others unless you all can, uh, Ray, Adam and Jessica, but that publication will be helpful too because it lists them in, in timing. Uh, so if it's summer, fall or spring. Right, and uh, Ray um, Tackett, he put a link just now in the chat um, that's a good resource for garden cover crops as well. Awesome. Um, so you can click on that link and it's a, it's a good publication from UK. Um, 
and and I will include the one that Amanda made. I don't know that it's on a website anywhere, but she had said that we were free to share it, and it is very user friendly the way that it's laid out. So um, I refer to it all the time. <laughs> so we can email that to everyone on the on the call today. Great. Yeah, I really like that one too. And I see a question that just came in about when is it safe to apply shredded leaves to my garden uh, that that you collected last fall, um, Lynn Ann. You can apply that um, now, but I would just apply it as, I mean, they're shredded up and they're probably pretty well composted, but I would apply it more of just a mulch at this point. And then it'll slowly break down rather than incorporating it into the soil. I would just apply it now and just use it as a mulch. It'd be great for that. Yeah. And by the time you next year rolls around and you do incorporate into your till again, um, it'll work well going down into the soil. So. Exactly. Um, we have another person. Um, thank you to Ray for the cover crop. Um, is there any preparation necessary for cover crops? Last winter, I threw down a Dutch white clover on top of grass and it did not take well. Yeah, so I mean, uh, with any any um, thing, and even we say this all the time with seeding your lawn, the, the key is getting good seed to soil contact. So um, if that's taking a hard rake and like really raking and scratching that seed into uh, the soil, because if, if there was grass on there, probably the birds and rain and a lot of that stuff can, can wash off or eat the seeds. Um, so unless you're really getting a good seed with soil contact, um, then you're not going to get a good take. So try to um, either scratch it into the soil with a hard rake or try to till in that area if you can um, so that you have some good soil for it to come for the seed to contact and get into. Right. Prior to seeding, right. Scratch that surface. It, yeah. Yeah. And then even at seeding, scratch right. those seeds into the soil yep. too, or with a soft rake even really at that point. Mm -hmm. I see this um, next one. A got thick it. Layer, yeah, I add a thick layer of multi-year seasoned horse manure to my beds this spring. At about fifty percent compost to fifty percent uh, garden soil, was that too much to add? Uh, no, that's about right. A lot of times now in the the landscape um, companies that where you can buy bulk mulch, uh, will sell a 50-50 mix, and I've used that before. Um, and, and it works well. The only thing is, it it is more. Um, more porous or well drained, so it can dry out faster. So that might be something to think about is just watch your watering. Uh, you might have to water more um, with that, but but no, um, it should be fine. Are there any other questions? You covered everything very well, Faye. So <laughs> sometimes you. your questions is fine. <laughs> I appreciate it. Someone made a comment about loving the stirrup hoe as well. And as much as to the extent you can love something that's hard work, but I totally agree. The stirrup hoe, even though, you know, weeding is not fun for anybody. I definitely, the stirrup hoe definitely makes it um, at least a little easier. Right. We do have another question. Um, they're saying I have another question. Is that okay? That's yeah, perfectly cool. fine. Um, we exclusively use fish emulsion for fertilizer for all crops. Is that okay? Um, yes, I mean, I would do a soil test if you haven't, just to see if you do need any other nu nutrients because fish emulsion is very, is more nitrogen than anything. Um, and I'm assuming you're just doing like a liquid fertilizing of it, um, or are you doing like a foliar? If it, I'm, I'm assuming you're doing it on the soil as a liquid. Yes, the liquid as a soil. Yeah, and uh, like I said, I, I mean, normally it's it's fine, especially here. Most of the, the what we need is the nitrogen. It does give you that nitrogen source, um, and so a lot of organic um, growers will use that. But it would be good to do a soil test just to check if you have anything else that you might need. And I forget the analysis of the of the fish emulsion. I think I have it right here. Do you all know off the top of your head? I do not know, but I know it's heavy nitrogen. I thought I had it right here but I don't, um, but I'd be, I'd be happy to, you know, follow up with that question if you want to email me or anything, but um, I think it, it's fine if it's mostly nitrogen. Okay, um, another question came in. I was suggested by two people to add lime to my home garden. I had bought some pelleted lime. Is this a good thing to add to Frankfurt clay soils? When, how much, and do you have any tips? <laughs> 
Well, Adam Leonberger, I know that the horticulture agreement that's on here represented Franklin County. I know he talks about the clay soils there in Franklin County. Um, but anytime, I, I know that's kind of a thing that is um, in the past, everybody's just said, oh, add lime every year, add lime in every year. But once again, really, you need to do that soil test to figure out if you do need it because you might not need lime at all and you won't know until you get that soil test and know the pH of your soil. Um, because otherwise then you have no idea how much to apply of it and you could over apply or under apply. And if you or if your pH is fine, then you don't, you don't even need it. Um, so sorry, I can't give you an exact on that, but it's, yeah, I would have no idea how much you need unless I have, unless you have that soil sample and, and Adam is awesome. And we'll do a great recommendation on how much you need of that. Okay. So she actually just, oh. so I, I did a soil test and it recommended lime, but I've been afraid to add any. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you had just been suggested by a person, but that's great. You did the soil test. And um, if you have that amount on there, then definitely uh, go ahead and do that. And pelletize is a great, mm -hmm. a great way to do it. So whatever it suggested on amounts to apply, uh, don't and, be afraid to apply it. That'll be great. And that can be added at any time of the year, lime can. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the biggest thing with it is it does take uh, several months. I mean, it can take up to six months, but when there's warmer weather, it does act faster. Um, so ideally you do it before you plant, um, but, um, work it in now. And, um, it's definitely, if it's suggested on your soil sample, 6.5 pH is about, you know, perfect for an, uh, for an, a, a vegetable garden. And so if your pH is too low, all the nutrients won't be available. And so that's why it's important to, to get it at that right level. And if the soil test recommended it, um, the lime, then yes, I'd go ahead and apply it. Yep. Um, Monica asks, how and when can we get one of those grow your own garden logs? And I believe that's the calendar that is the dry erase calendar. Um, and this is going to be a little bit different for every um, county based on our supply. Monica, I'm not sure. I think you are in Woodford County, according to registration. So um, yeah. Faye, you can answer that. As far as Harrison County, I still have some from last year. So um, I have some available now and some counties are, we just got an email the other day to order some. Um, so some people already ha still have them in stock and some people had to order some. So Faye, did you order some then? I did. I ordered okay. some and I'm, she hasn't said for sure. She has our name on the list and she hasn't said for sure, like Jessica said, when it'll come in. But Monica, I can put your name on this one because I do have like <laughs> one or two left if you want, and then um, you can come pick it up. Um, just let me know and um, I will reserve that for you. And then we should be getting some in soon. Sounds good. Any other questions? Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate your attendance. Um, fairly soon you will get a survey um, within the next couple of weeks that we'll be asking about the classes that we had in April and just what you attended and if you learned things and what you liked and suggestions and things like that. So be looking for that email. Also be looking for the email um, within today or tomorrow probably with this presentation um, as well as that cover crop publication that we're gonna send. Um, and then next week we do not have a class because we do the first three Thursdays. Um, so there's no class next week, and then we will start back up in May. Um, hopefully you've already registered for it. If you have not registered, you can go back in and register again for, for any classes that you might have left off originally. So, um, and what was the, what's the next one, Faye? Um, the next class in May is, oh, it's summer tree identification. Um, if any of you joined us in January, we had a winter tree identification um, class and he did a fantastic job. It's gonna be the same speaker, um, but we'll be talking about how to identify trees now that they have leaves on them. So um, I hope you'll can, you can join us for that because uh, Dr. McLaren does a fantastic job and um, it's really good information that that we can all use in our horticulture knowledge. So, <laughs> but if there's not any further questions, thanks again for joining us and we will see you the next time. Thank you, Faye. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks everyone.